that's what I call fun. Ladies and gentlemen, the Rogers and Spencer is probably the most convenient and best looking percussion revolver of the world. And if you check the winners of the World Championships and European Championships, you can easily say that it is probably the most successful one also. And I'm a lucky guy because I have an original on hand that we can try at the range. And I have some repros, including the Pedersoli version also. So, but before we go to the range, let's check their history first. We can all agree that the solid frame Remington revolver is a more sophisticated sidearm than the open top Colt, but we can also agree that their grip is too small, don't fit in the hands of today's shooters. But if you're after a solid frame large grip revolver, then get a Rogers and Spencer. The story starts with C.B. Horde, owner of an armory in Waterton, New York, who purchased the patent of Austin T. Freeman to produce a solid frame percussion revolver for the US Army. The Freeman revolver was a mix of the Remington and Star revolvers and did not impress the Owen Holt Commission. Only 2000 were ever made and the patent was later sold to Rogers and Spencer. The second parent of the Rogers and Spencer is a self-cocking double-action internal hammer revolver designed by C.S. Pettengill in the 1850s. The straightforward design proved to be quite interesting for the Navy and Army, so they placed an initial order of 5000 pieces, but only 2000 were actually delivered as they proved to be quite unreliable. These 2000 pieces were manufactured in the Rogers and Spencer Company in Willowville, New York in late 1862 and early 1863. And why they are considered the best on the market? Let's check their technical specifications. The Rogers and Spencer Company purchased the patent of the Freeman and Pettengill revolvers and combined their best qualities to design the most sophisticated SA revolver of the Civil War era. The solid frame, the large grips, the 44 caliber, the oversized parts are all indication of a good martial arm. Henry S. Rogers received a contract from the War Department on November 24, 1864 for 5,000 of the revolvers at 12 US dollars each. The total batch was delivered until 1865 September, too late to take part in the war. Let's check the little details why we like the Rogers. Let's start with the cone-shaped front side that is not easy to adjust, but with the matching notch in the rear side, it gives an excellent side picture. This Rogers and Spencer is clearly an unissued piece with military markings on all parts. The top of the frame shows the name and location of the maker. The small fine letters on each separate parts are sub-inspection marks of the New York Arsenal, showing that each part passed the test separately. The serial is also visible on each major part. The cartouche in the grip panel is the mark of the final acceptance of the complete revolver. This grip also has three cuts, which meaning is unknown for me. According to the serial, this pistol was made probably in July or August 1865. This Rogers and Spencer still cycles like a Swiss watch with a crisp trigger and a strong hammer spring. To determine the right size of ball to use, I slack the bore as usual, and it turned out that the standard 454 round ball will be just fine for the job. This pistol belongs to a member of the Hungarian national muzzle loading team, so I already knew that 15 grains of 3F Swiss powder and 24 grains of corn wet filler will do the job. The lube is the standard revolver lube I usually use. The distance is 25 meters and I'm using the same target as we use on international muzzle loading matches. The rear side of the trigger guard acts as a trigger stop, so the feel of the pull is very close to the target pistols we use today.
let's check what we have here. So this is the original. I have three shots in the 10, two nines, and one in the 8. It seems like that one chamber is, is uh, throwing away the bullet, so maybe it has some damage. But uh, all the others are good. Unfortunately, there are no easy to access repros on the market today since your arms went out of the black powder business a few years ago. The engraved revolver in my right hand is an old Euro arms copy with the standard bore. Although it was not an expensive repro, the overall quality of the weapon is very good. The other repro is a pedersoli copy with a broach rifled fast twist match grade bore and it is also a very good representation of the original with some minor modifications having the target shooter in mind. The original bore has 5 lens and grooves with equal size and a twist rate around 1 turn in 26 inches. The Pedersoli match grade bore has 7 grooves with a faster 1 turn in 18 inch rifling. The standard Eurarms version has a button rifled bore with 6 grooves and 1 turn in 26 inches twist rate, so it is not hard to differentiate the repros from the original. Both repros are excellent copies, so repro parts can be a good source for repairing an original, but the fit is not perfect, so you better find a good gunsmith for the job. As usual, I try to swap the cylinders, and although the cylinder itself seems to be interchangeable, the axis needs some minor treatment. The Pedersoli Repro is targeted to competition diameter. shooters, and its bore is a bit larger than usual, so I suggest you to go for the 457 round bore for a tight fit. The surface of the pistol is mud black to avoid sun reflections, and the front sight is dovetail to have a possibility to adjust the horizontal aim. The pedestal repro likes a bit more force than the original, so I used 18 grains of 3F Swiss powder while achieving the best group. This is a Pedersoli Repro. I have five shots in the 10 size group, three shots in the same, nearly in the same hole. And I only have one flyer, uh, six o'clock, six here. It's a precise target shooting pistol. The disassembly of the Rogers and Spencer is a bit different from the Colts and Remingtons, so let me show you my version of taking this pistol apart. First find the right position for the screw fixing the cylinder axis, put the hammer in half cock and use the loading lever to retract the axis and remove the cylinder. Now remove the grip panels to free the housing of the mainspring. The mainspring fits tight and strong into the frame, so you have to find a way to release its tension to take the firing mechanism apart. There are three screws holding the trigger guard, start with the one in front of the trigger. Now squeeze the trigger guard and the frame with your left palm and unscrew the two remaining screws. Keep the force on the revolver until both screws are removed. Now you can easily remove the bottom frame with the mainspring. To complete the process, just remove the remaining parts one by one. The 
The reassembly is just as easy. The only tricky part is putting the mainspring back to its place. Start with the front screw again and use a screwdriver to force the mainspring back to its place. Now squeeze the parts together again and remount the screws. And there you go, your Rogers and Spencer is ready to roll again. The so diameter the of the diameter. bore of the Euroarm 3 Pro is quite close to the original, so the 454 round bore will be a good choice here as well. Just like with the Pedersoli Repro, the 18 grain 3F Swiss powder was the good solution here as well for the best group. The action and the trigger pull is not as smooth as the Pedersoli, but with a little magic touch it can be transferred into a tech driver I'm sure. Eurarms also manufactured the match version with a fast with Lothar Walter bore, but that's also disappeared from the market. And this is a Euro Arms, and it's not bad at all. So I have four shots in the size of the ten ring, and I have two flyers. And not bad, absolutely not bad. It's also a good quality repro. The Rogers and Spencer arrived too late to be used in the Civil War, and although many still tries to prove its so action, there is no real evidence on hand today. The story of these revolvers ends with Francis Bannerman, who sees the excellent possibility to deal with surplus military goods after the hostilities ended. He bought an island on the Hudson River close to New York to store his enormous stockpile and published the catalog to sell the goods to civilians and to other countries. He sold all the 5,000 revolvers on the civilian market sometime in the early 1900s. Traditional target shooting is so much fun, but the best thing is to push these old irons to their limits. Let's see some long range fun with the Peder Soli version. Okay, so the distance is around 90 meters and the size of the metal plate is around 40 centimeters by 60 centimeters, so an upper body. Let's see if we can hit it with this beautiful Peder Soli Repro. I think it was a bit high.
Not that bad, but I was expecting a bit more. But it's fun anyway. So, ladies and gentlemen, I really hope you enjoyed this little time travel again. You've been watching the Cap and Will YouTube channel, and if you like what I do, then please don't forget to hit the subscribe button down there. Thank you.